ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Stuart Chevin. It was a cold day in April in 1969, but at police headquarters, the crowd was hot. I was just 12 years old. I was there with my friends, my closest friends, Hugh and Stephen, and we were looking out over a sea of defiance. Two lawyers, Kenny Cockrell and Justin Ravitz, were delivering speeches that were eloquent, and we were just getting fired up. And I was just anxious because from you could see inside 1300 Bobby and the police were looking out, waiting for that order to disperse the crowd. But we rose up. Support Judge Crockett, justice for New Bethel. No, I didn't think it was so strange being there, 12 years old, supporting a black jurist I never even met. It was just part of a journey of, of knowing. Now I grew up on the, uh, the near northwest side of Detroit on Wildermere Street. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but at that time, the neighborhood was mostly Roman Catholic, but there were, there were quite a few, bit a few Jews in the neighborhood as well. And you could tell who was who, okay? Because the Smiths on our left, they had nine kids. The McCarthy's, they had seven kids. And, and the Wachowski's on the right side of us, they had 12. They had so many kids, they used to ring a cowbell to bring them all in for dinner. Now our house, it was a quiet home. On Sunday mornings, my, uh, my father would do the New York Times crossword puzzle in pen. <laughs> and my mother, you could hear the of her ironing my jeans. <laughs> oh, no, wait a minute. I didn't mention to you the people of color in our neighborhood. And there's a reason, because in 1962, there weren't any. We ate differently, okay? Now the Catholic kids, they had for lunch, they had Oscar Mayer bologna with some Miracle Whip with Wonder Bread. And my mother said to me, now Stuart, when they bring that out, when they try to feed you that, I want you to nicely say, you need to go home. <laughs> because we don't eat anything that has a shelf life of 50 years. So I'd go home and I'd get some nice brisket or maybe like um, a tongue sandwich on caraway rye. Now, I wasn't too fond of tongue sandwich, kind of you know, crazy, but I ate it anyway. There were times that the Smiths used to take me along to the Detroit Yacht Club. And uh, we'd all pile in the car. There'd be 10 of us, but I was the only one with dark curly hair. Okay. Now, the DYC at that time was restricted to Jews and blacks. So we'd be driving up, and slowly the, slowly the wheels of the car come into the guard shack, and I'm starting to get nervous. But I was told what to say. And the guard asked me, like, so what's your, what's your name, sir? And I said, my name is Stuart Smith. That's all I had to do was deny who I was and I'd be swimming in a nice, cool pool. That's all I had to do. Now, in my neighborhood, the university district, the, uh, the Catholic kids, they went to Jesu Parish. I, went to the, I walked the other way and I went to Hampton Elementary. This is public school. And I was anxious to get to Hampton on the first day of third grade. And I walk into the first day of third grade, and they sit me down. And right behind me, there's this blonde kid I've never seen before. And uh, he wants to impress me. He comes up and he goes, Stuart. His name's Hugh. He, uh, Hugh goes, Stuart, uh, my father is an Episcopal minister. So listen, uh, when the tests come around, you'll give me the answers, right? 
and I'm thinking, what's an Episcopal? <laughs> it would be two years later before I came into school and I'm sitting down first day and the door opens up and the first black boy comes into Hampton Elementary. He gets introduced to the teacher. She sits him down on the side. And the hush that came over that class was deafening. Um, his, uh, his name was Stephen Burgess, and I could see by looking at him that he felt incredibly alone. But um, something happened. I, I mean, the other kids, they didn't get next to him so much, or, or Hugh, because they weren't, they weren't part of his, uh, they weren't part of the tribe, okay? But I, these two kids became, and I became like inseparable, you know, and we hung out. Now, Stephen's house, I'd go over there, and it was a lot like mine. It was quiet, subdued, but one difference, it smelled like bacon. <laughs> And I'm like, I'm all over this. <laughs> because bacon isn't like 50 years old or anything like that. It hasn't that much shelf life. And, and I just devoured this bacon. <laughs> and uh, it, was, it was the best. <laughs> it was just the best. I just couldn't get enough. Now, the Burgesses, they were both educators. And Mrs. Burgess, she was always impeccably dressed. And she wore her rouge just very nicely. And Mr. Burgess, he was a quiet man and, and very thoughtful. Now, Hugh's house, on the other hand, was out there. Okay, I'd go over there and there'd be lots of noise. And uh, like, it's totally different from my house. In my house, the living room is where you went when company came over. Otherwise, no one walked into the living room. <laughs> when, uh, but in Hugh's house, there were all kinds of people. And his parents were very welcoming. His parents had me call them by their first name. Now, no one ever called anybody by their first name. And I asked Hugh about this, and I, he said, well, listen, my parents are Marxists. <laughs> and I found out that Marxists do a lot of different things differently than a lot of people. <laughs> now, in their, in their living room, they had potlucks, they were like savory potluck dinners. And uh, all kinds of people would come over. It was like a United Nations of people, all different colors, religions, different kinds of music, different kinds of dress. And we'd have these potluck dinners and people would be talking about religion or politics or civil rights. And one person would go, that's not how it's done. And the next person would go and say like, well, didn't you read dialectical and historical materialism? I mean, people screamed, but then people would hug. And I had never been around this. I felt included. They made me feel like I was real, and I was impressed. And I'll tell you, I ate it up. <laughs> As all the time that I could, days, nights, weekends, holidays, I was at Hughes. Now, back at Hampton, uh, sixth grade and uh, we got a, not a whole lot of change, but our music teacher, Mrs. Randall, was our first uh, African-American teacher. And she was our music teacher, and she would bang out on a upright piano, Negro spirituals. <laughs> and here she is with like 21 Jewish kids and 11 <laughs> Gentile kids and two black kids, and she's doing, lift every voice and sing. And she's trying to do it in the round, too. <laughs> now, this was totally out of my album, and I didn't understand it. But I will say it was uplifting, because I was used to, like, Avinu Malkeinu, which, if you know that, it's, like, totally depressing. And it makes you feel like you just got turned away from Ellis Island, something like that. <laughs> I left sixth grade at Hampton, last day of school, come out. It's last day of school. And it's a beautiful day, sunny. And I feel the emancipation that summer is going to bring in June of 1967. But in July, it all changed. 
So I'm standing out outside of my house one night and I can see in the distance smoke billowing from the south. And I can hear from Livernoy paint cans exploding at the Merchandise Mart hardware store. And this is making me shiver. And I'm seeing National Guard trucks going down the street. And I'm hearing TV reports and things sounding like so immediate at the same time so far away and distant. It was, but, but a, a week goes by and it, uh, it all subsides, the city starts to subside. And we get to this new normalcy and, uh, and the one difference is now we're all locking our doors. September comes and I'm gonna go back to school. Now it's my first day of junior high school. And I go back and like, what happened? The Jewish people are gone. The script has been flipped. There's like three white kids in my class and the rest of the kids are all black. I didn't know how to process the whole thing. I'm just like 11 years old. Did my parents stay here because they loved their house with leaded windows or did they just not have enough money to move away to the suburbs? I didn't know. But I assimilated because that's what you do. First thing, I learned the four corners, okay? And I'm dancing to Edward Starr, like, mm, 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 mm. yeah. But it gets better, it gets better. I'm, I'm still like African-American fashion is the rage and I so desperately want to fit in. So I, my mother is kind of, she makes me a dashiki. And it's a brown dashiki with gold trim and she made it from a singer sewing pattern. Now, I don't know why she did it. I figured just because white people don't know where to buy a dashiki. My math teacher, he's African American, my new math teacher. And he's got a, uh, a paddle, you know, like a, a fraternity paddle. And it's got four big holes in it, drilled in it for effect. And I'll tell you, and, and if you were br bring the class in, he had no problem using that paddle. And I watch his dis in total disbelief, and Darnell Jackson gets called to the front of the class. For whack! Whoa! Uh, don't look, stand up to him, Darnell. For whack! And the, the girls go crazy, and this is like a male rite of passage. I couldn't, I mean, I just could deal, the whole thing was like, was kind of beyond me and I'm, I'm just done. Hampton started to turn into a will, a, uh, like just getting through it. It was a test of endurance and I was failing the test. And in English class one day I get up and I walk up to Mrs. Stemple and I say, I am over this shit. <laughs> and I walk out of Hampton and I don't look back. Now I get home to my parents and they say, I, I, I say, I wanna quit school. They said, no way. So they enroll me into a public school down the far west side of Detroit around six and Telegraph. It was an area we called Copper Canyon and we call it Copper Canyon because at that time the police had to live in the city of Detroit. So if you're a white cop, you want to live at the limit of the city limits. So I go up the first day, I get on the Second Avenue bus and I look up and I see there's 20 other black kids on the same bus. And it turns out their parents thought their neighborhood school was a dead end too. I mean, I had gotten used to this, like, I mean, I was no longer Jewish at Hampton Junior High, but now, I mean, I was just white. Now it's a whole different thing. And we get to this school, they, they were coming to Emerson Junior High with me too, and they get off the bus, and I get off the bus, and now it's like, they're being called nigger. And I am being called, you long-haired kike. 
But I didn't let these words bother me. As a matter of fact, it kind of built up a camaraderie between me and my fellow bus riders. Especially a little interest I had in uh, Darnese Davis. <laughs> All the while, my parents, they wanted me to, um, you know, stay with the Jewish thing. My mother takes, drives me out to uh, Shur Etzedek in Southfield for bar mitzvah classes. And we get in the car, and I just feel like I'm being taken. And I'm quiet, and I get to the, to the, to the thing, and I get inside the school. And all these kids, I just can't relate to them. I mean, they don't know anything about Detroit. They don't know anything about the war in Vietnam. They don't know anything about Jews and civil rights and their connection with black people. And they sure don't know how to dance. <laughs> and I have to tell you that after all this, I, I'm just strangely thinking, I'm feeling anti-Semitic. I mean, the only person I could connect to was Mr. Mergentheim. He was the teacher. And he would tell stories. Uh, he went to school, same school as my parents did, Central High School on Linwood. And he would tell me about those places and about being you know, back on Dexter and Davison. And I just felt really comfortable with him. I mean, I was confused. I was searching. And I was just trying to find answers. And it just made me out there. And I, I just wanted to connect. A couple years later, I'm, uh, I'm at one of my favorite places with my mother, the Detroit Institute of Arts. Uh, there was an ex exhibition going on there, um, Gordon Parks was doing an exhibition there. Now, Gordon Parks was well known for doing Shaft, directing Shaft, but he was also a very incredible journal uh, photographer, uh, photojournalism, right, and fashion and stuff. And uh, I'm walking through the museum. And, the, and I see my mother has stopped dead in her tracks, and her mouth is agape at this uh, silver print, this large print. And I look over, and I come over, and I see that it's uh, three boys. One of them is a black boy, and he's got a poster. And the poster reads, Support Judge Crockett. And to the right of him, kind of cut off, I look over, I see, Wade, kind of cut off the picture. That's Hugh. My friend Hugh, and I look down on the lower left, and that is me. <laughs> now I look over at my mother, and I see the expression on her face change. And she says, you know, like, I can tell what she's thinking. She's thinking, you know, my friends might have sons that, you know, daughters that are getting A's in class. And their sons might be dating Jewish girls. But they have no Gordon Parks picture up on the museum at there that they know about. <laughs> little did she know that uh, it'd be a little while, many years later, I'd be calling her up on the phone to say, uh, I'm getting married to a Jewish woman. <laughs> and, I'm moving to the suburbs. <laughs> but I did, and she dropped the phone. And that's literal, that's no stage joke. <laughs> now I have a copy, we have a copy of the photograph uh, quietly displayed in our home on the hall. <laughs> and it reminds me of, uh, that my parents allowed in me a just a, a path to go out on my own. And I found out that by staying in Detroit, I was able to learn about the differences in us and finally connect with what I was and learn that as opposed to denying it, I could try to elevate what I was and my people. We have this saying, never again. And, uh, you know, for a lot of Jews, it means it's about the Holocaust. For me, it's a little bit beyond that. It's, there's a bigger picture. The bigger picture is never, that means like, 
never any more injustice. And that justice is about for everybody, no matter what race or no matter what culture. Um, I talked to my daughter you know, over the years, and she's really exceptional. And we talk about that racial equality is more than just about tolerance. It's about embracing and celebrating all the things that we are. And we're unique. That's what we are. Thank you. Start seven. <laughs>